seconds before I know it or something. Hey, everybody. This is Jeff Hester from SoCalHiker.net, and welcome to happy hour number 15, the one about dispersed camping. Uh, this is a topic that's really interesting to me, especially during this pandemic that's going on, because, you know, what better way to maintain physical distance, but still be able to do, um, you know, enjoy the outdoors and camp and get outside. And there's other great reasons to enjoy that, too. And so tonight, what we do, one of the things we did is I invited uh, John Sores, and I'll tell you just a little bit about him. He has a, uh, a new book out called Camp for Free, Dispersed Camping and Boondocking on America's Public Lands. And a little bit about John, he's been dispersed camping for over 30 years, so he, he knows his stuff, all right? Um, and he's author of, a, of num a number of hiking guidebooks, including 100 Classic Hikes, Northern California, uh, Hike the Parks series from uh, Mountaineers Press, uh, Redwood National and State Parks, uh, day hiking, Mount Shasta, Lassen, and Trinity Alps regions, and uh, he's got some other books in the works, too. So um, what we're going to do is I'm going to kick things off with a quick poll. So as you're joining, um, we're at, I'm going to ask you two things. First, in the chat, that you leave a comment and say, hey, you know, hi, guys, great to hear from you, and, and let us know where you're joining from. You know, if you're joining, not I don't mean by your living room or your, your office, but you know what? What city or area are you joining us from? And then I am going to pop open. If this works, this will we'll see. I'm going to pop open a poll. And with any luck, uh, this is going to show up somewhere. So um, I'll give it a moment, and we'll see. And uh, hey, John, maybe give me a thumbs up if you see a poll on the screen. Oh, I I don't see a poll yet. Oh darn. <laughs> but I'm looking. I'm I am stuff. seeing replies, though. So, okay, well, then. There you go. So we have, the, the, the question poll. was, the poll question is, uh, what is your experience with dispersed camping? Plenty? John, I would say you have, you have plenty. Some. I, <laughs> uh, I have, like, a little tiny, tiny bit, and I'll share something about that, or none. You know, like, this is a whole new world. Um, fifty-eight percent have some. Uh, fifteen percent have plenty. Thirty-one percent have none. So, uh, pretty widespread. A little bit, people have uh, dipped into it a little bit. And uh, hey, it's great to see everybody out there. Jim Benjamin, thanks for joining tonight. A buddy of mine who's done some dispersed camping. Uh, Lauren Cheeseman, uh, Philip Yoho. Hey, good to see ya. Uh, Cindy, Daniel, Ted, all right, all, a lot of bunch of people in there. All right, I'm going to show the um, show the results, and hopefully those will pop up on the screen. 60% said they have some experience, quite a few. 30%, 33% said none, and 6% have plenty. So maybe we'll be able to hear, hopefully we'll be able to answer some questions uh, that you might have, but you'll also get an opportunity to share maybe your advice or your own tips. So love that. All right. Um, without further ado, let's bring in uh, John. And uh, let me flip over here. John, there he is. Hey, uh, thank you for joining us tonight and being a part of our happy hour. We've been doing these since the uh, when the uh, stay at home order was issued in California a while back, back in March. We started doing these every week and we've been doing them over zoom primarily and it's been a very sort of informal thing we've had a topic generally and we've talked about first aid we've talked about um uh backpacking trips uh beginner hiking you know trails and all kinds of things and uh one of the topics that a lot of people suggested over and over again was dispersed camping there's a lot of interest in that and uh, i think for good reason so uh, John, maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and your background with dispersed camping and kind of why you were interested. Why did you decide to write a book about it and why now? Well, first, let me say thank you, Jeff, for hosting this. And uh, it's good to bring the two parts of the state together, Southern California with SoCal hikers. And I'm a Northern California 
hiking trails guy, so I do love Southern California, and I love getting down there and visiting and hiking, and I'm sure Southern California hikers also like to come to Northern California. Dispersed camping is something that has really been a part of my life since probably, well, over 30 years ago when I was in my 20s is when I first started doing it. As you said in the introduction, I've written several hiking guide books for Mountaineers Books, which is a major outdoors publisher up in Seattle. And during the course of that, I had to do a lot of research for my hikes. And I just found that, hey, I'm off in Tahoe National Forest or Klamath National Forest. I've got a lot of hikes to do and always on a budget. Dispersed camping just really fit the bill for me because I would be able to just camp out in these beautiful, beautiful areas on national forest lands and have nobody around. And best of all, it's absolutely free. So that's really how I got my start was when I was writing my my hiking guide books. Although I could say a time that really sticks in my mind uh, as far as dispersed camping that was actually earlier than writing the books, my, my father passed away when I was 28 years old, when I was in graduate school. Uh, he was on his way to Alaska to spend the whole summer exploring Alaska. I was the one of my four siblings, I was the one that was chosen to fly to Vancouver, BC, and then fly some more up to Prince George, I think, and then I hitchhiked the rest of the way up into northern British Columbia to get my father's truck, actually, and drive his truck back, and he had it all set up to sleep in the back. So that's when I really did my first extensive dispersed camping was driving his truck back. And I, he was the one who really instilled the love of the outdoors for hiking and camping and just everything outdoors in me. So I decided to honor his memory by just driving very slowly through British Columbia. I went to the Canadian Rockies, uh, Banff and Jasper National Parks, and came down through Idaho. But the very first night that I did dispersed camping in my father's truck, happened to be very nearby the area he passed away suddenly from a heart attack just very quick which is a great way to go and doing something he loved in a beautiful place so i felt very good about that but i i slept um just a couple miles away from where he passed away and that was just kind of interesting to feel that sort of that connection of the the continuity of life and just understanding how important life is and the importance of really living it. And for me, that's been being outdoors and being outside, hiking and also dispersed camping. Wow, that's a great story. I can imagine with that connection, you know, that sort of like passing the baton almost, you know, like even taking the yeah. same truck that he had been using and driving it back yes. and, and camping. That's really cool. Yeah, and an interesting part of that, it's a little... Uh, little interesting but that first night I'm sleeping in that truck there's a lot of bears in British Columbia and in the middle of the night there was actually a bear outside the truck and uh, it's just kind of interesting I'm not a, a like an overly metaphysical person at all but to me it was just interesting like here's this bear you know coming around the truck it did no damage no problems but it was just it was, it was just, just check cool. on you yeah, just checking on me. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. So in your book, you talk a little bit about the differences between uh, dispersed camping versus boondocking. Um, you, I, I noticed you didn't answer the question, you know, what is a what's the difference between boondocking and, and boondoggle? But um, <laughs> maybe you could address what the, the nuances of those, those the terminology yeah, I'm very happy to do that. The key thing about boondocking versus boondoggle, a big part of the reason why I wrote this book is so that if you go disperse camping or boondocking, it doesn't turn into a boondoggle. So disperse camping is when you get in your vehicle, you go out on public lands where dispersed camping is allowed, and there's over 400 million acres in the United States where you can do dispersed camping. It's when you go out on those lands, primarily national forest lands, BLM lands, but also some national preserves and especially national monuments. There's a lot of places you can do it there too. 
So when you go out on those lands, you find a beautiful place out in the woods or out in the desert where it's not an official campground. It's a place, there may be a fire ring there, but there's a place for you to pull in or pull over. It's down a dirt road and you can park your vehicle there. You can set up a tent. You can put out your lawn chairs and you can just totally enjoy being out there. That's dispersed camping. So it's in any vehicle down any usually dirt road that you can get on on public lands and find a place to to camp where you're way away from everybody else and it's not organized. There's no picnic tables. There's no bathrooms. There's none of that. So that's dispersed camping. Boondocking is a term that is used primarily by people in RVs. So when I titled the book, I went camp for free, dispersed camping and boondocking on America's public lands. I put both those terms in there. So boondocking is what people in RVs do. However, RVs can only go on certain dirt roads because they're long and they're wide and they may potentially have clearance issues. So they're limited in where they can go. Whereas dispersed camping, it's wide open depending on what vehicle you have. Okay, cool. Now you talked about how um, in dispersed camping, there's no facilities, there's no restrooms, there's no, you know, water pump, there's no, uh, you know, uh, there's probably not a, ho a there's no camp host, there's no campfire rings or any of that stuff. So, uh, you know, what is what what is somebody who's gone from like myself? I've done mostly camping in campgrounds. When I'm not backpacking, I'm in a, I'm in a, you know, a car camping. I'm camping in a campground. Uh, the one exception would be uh, last November, uh, myself and uh, Richard uh, Opalar, we were dri driving out to uh, Sedona, and we left on, I don't know, a Friday, late on a Friday night, and we, he had kind of looked at the maps and found some BLM land that was not too far off the highway, but far enough off the highway. And, uh, you know, we went out there and, you know, found some, I found a flat spot. He slept in his van. I slept in, on the ground. You know, I just rolled out my, uh, my sleeping bag and a pad and I cowboy camped. Uh, and there were, there were a, a few other people within sight of us. We weren't close, but, you, you know, there were, there were other people doing the same thing, you know, elsewhere in little flat spots in the land. And uh, so... But it felt a little bit weird. I mean, I was fine with it. But um, how do you make that transition from like a, a full blown campground, which could have all kinds of services and amenities to dispersed camping? What advice do you have for, for folks doing that? In one word, preparation. You have to make sure that you take everything that you're going to need to take care of yourself. So in a campground, you've got a picnic table which is great for sitting on, of course, but when you go to first camping, you if you're in a, a van that is all, like some people have great sprinter vans and full-size vans that have tables and toilets and all sorts of stuff inside of them, and it's really very, very cushy living for them. If you're doing it a little rougher, like what my sweetheart Stephanie and I do, we have a minivan. We have a Kia Sedona minivan. We're super comfortable sleeping in there, but we have to be prepared to pretty much cook outside and, and spend time outside. So you have to do whatever you need to do to be fully prepared to be comfortable and happy when you're out there. Of course, a key thing about that, if you don't have a toilet in your vehicle, you're going to have to go outside and you're going to have to follow like the, you know, the, key, uh, the key principles for doing that ethically. But th those are key differences there is that you have to really be prepared for everything. And there's a, a whole other aspect of this with an organized campground with the tables and the fire rings and maybe a hot shower and all that stuff. You know where those campgrounds are. And nowadays, many of them, you can make a reservation online. So you can say, oh, well, I know I can go to such and such campground, and I've got site 27 for the next two nights, and you know you're set, and it's all good. 
So with dispersed camping, there is an element of the unknown in that if you're, well, for example, I live up, well, right now I actually live in Ashland, Oregon, which is just a few miles north of the border with California, but most of my home territory has been Redding north to Mount Shasta and then east to Lassen Volcanic National Park and then west out to the Trinity Alps and on all the way over to the coast where Redwood National State Parks is. I know lots of places from experience where I can go disperse camping in those areas because I've scouted it and I just know where my spots are. I have a, a Word document where I've written down the directions on how to get there. I have maps so I know where to go. But a key thing about dispersed camping, if it's a place you haven't been to, there's a little bit of an element of the unknown of, am I going to find a good site? Am I going to find a site at all? Now, many people sleep in their vehicles. And if you do that, it's a lot easier to find a site because you really just need a place that's level and not directly on the road. And if you go down a dirt road that's really not getting much traffic, there's a really good chance that nobody's going to drive by your site at all. So there's that aspect of it. But you have to be prepared for that. You also have to do preparation ahead of time to research where you think it's quite likely that you will find places to camp. And then there's also ways that you could call, if it's a national forest land, you can call the local ranger district and say, I want to go disperse camping and down this dirt road and this rough in this general area, can you give me advice on places where I can find sites? And oftentimes they can say, yes, you can go here, you can go here, you can go here. Yeah, that's a that's a great point is to check with the local agencies that, you know, the, the ranger station or whatever, just to get advice and tips because, you know, they'll know for sure. Like, like you know, you're, you know, the, the areas in Northern California really well because you've been there for so many years they know their area is pretty well. And so they're able to give you some advice that way. That's, that's really smart. Um, yes. And that's, just, that's really important part of doing the research. And we can go into that more detail uh, later on if you want, but that that's important. Yeah. And I can give more detailed advice on how to do that. Yeah. Um, so in the, I, I like to plan things out, you know, so, you know, like you were saying, exactly. You know, I go online, I say, all right, we're going from here to here to here on the map. And, you know, here are some campgrounds. Let's see what's available. Let's look online, you know, let's book. Okay, we've got, like you say, camp campsite 17 is, is booked for this night. The The flip side of that is that it's more expensive. You're, you're paying for those sites. And we've had cases where our plans changed and we had to just basically eat that cost because it's done. You know, you don't get a refund for not using it. And um, um, but the, uh, the flip side of that is, you know, going and, and having a general idea of where you might be able to camp and having that you have to add additional time for flexibility, you know, because I, I, in your book, you give several examples of stories where you drove down a road and you had to turn around and you drove back to the highway and you kept on going and, um, you know, so I guess you have to factor that into the planning for dispersed camping, right? You definitely do. And there will be times like there's times when we've been able to really thoroughly plan where we're going to go. And I feel really confident. Yeah, there's, we're going to go down this dirt road. I'm pretty sure we'll find a spot. And if we don't, there's these other two dirt roads that will go down. So I feel pretty good about it. There's other times when it may not be quite as clear, or if you're traveling a long distance, say you're, you're traveling around the West and maybe you didn't have the opportunity to call the local ranger and you're just looking at a map or looking at roads or saying, Hmm, we're on BLM road. Hmm, here's a good looking dirt road here. Let's go down it. Uh, that starts getting a little bit more chancy. And one key piece of advice I have for that is if you can at all help it, try to find your site before dark. It's a lot harder when you're just driving down dirt roads trying to figure out, is, can I find a place? What's the condition of this road? All those sorts of things. Daylight is far better. And it's always best to plan it like, hey, 
like you want to find your site like an hour before sunset is is the best way to do it. So that's Especially, kind of your rule of thumb is you know you try to set up set camp or you know break camp at, at uh, by a certain time an hour before sunset let's say. Right, or certainly no later than sunset. You really don't want to be out there with diminishing light or even dark trying to, you know, trying to find a place to camp. I can say, though, that in all the many years where I did disperse camping alone and then over the last uh, 10 plus years that I've been doing it with Stephanie, I would say 99.5% of the time I've been able to find uh, ranging from a good site to a great site. So that's, uh, especially when you start getting more experience, you get better and better at figuring out where good, uh, where good sites can be. One key thing to think about is what is the topography of the land? So if you're in steep mountains and there's just this dirt road that's going along the side of a steep mountain, you need something level either to park your vehicle or to pitch tent. So that's not good terrain. It's important to look at topographical maps and to use apps like uh, Gaia GPS and other ones that will show you the topography so you can see, oh, it's there's, okay, this is the mountains, but here's kind of a flat. I see where this dirt road goes um, through this relatively flat area where there's a good chance that there will be a place for, for us to park or to camp or to set up a tent. So describe for us what is what makes the ideal dispersed campsite in your mind? There's different types of ideal campsites for me. Number one, I like it to be private. I don't like other people around. Not that it's bad if other people are around. I've come across a lot of people out there doing dispersed camping, and it's been almost all uniformly positive, and they're, they're good people out there, just like me, that love you know, being out in, the, in nature and, and things like that. But I prefer one that is private and, and isolated, that doesn't have people around and isn't going to have a substantial number of people driving by. That's why in the book, I talk about when you're finding a dispersed camping site, there's usually a main road that you start on that typically gets a significant amount of traffic. There may be a level place that you could park your van or vehicle there and, and sleep right beside there, and it may be legal to do that, but there's going to be some vehicles coming by. And I personally don't like that, so I look for a secondary road, a road that goes off that main road, and that's how I start exploring for my dispersed camping site. So I want one that is private and also quiet. If there are roads or highways nearby, like paved roads with significant traffic, I try to be at least a half a mile away from those, so I'm not having to hear the traffic noise from that. I like it to have a level place or a level enough place for me to be able to park my vehicle so that we can sleep relatively level in the vehicle. Those are key aspects for me. Then after that, it's what is the quality of the area that I'm in. For example, in the Southwest, I have camped and we have camped in so many stunningly beautiful places. For example, on the, um, the cover of my book here, um, you can see that this is in the Southwest. This was taken outside of Zion National Park. Well, the Southwest has just got thousands upon thousands of places where you can park your vehicle and you just have these open views of this stunning sedimentary rock scenery or you could be in Nevada somewhere and you have beautiful mountains and wide open playas and things like that. So I go for what is beautiful scenery. Up here in Northern California, we have a lot of forest mountains. So it could be, am I in a beautiful section of forest? Am I near a gorgeous stream? Do I have a view of a mountain range that is really nice to look at? So that's, that's really what I'm looking for in dispersed campsite. I don't know if you know this person, Stephanie Hoffman, but she says that you are great at finding 
the perfect spot for us. <laughs> yes, uh, I know Stephanie very, very well. She's my <laughs> sweetie and the love of my life. So she's uh, she's my dispersed camping partner in crime. And it's true. So she wrote a uh, in the book. I have a, a section at the end of it, each chapter that is or, or stories, and it's either my story or our story, and then a few of them are Stephanie's story. And she's got a story in there where she talks about how there's times we'll start driving down a dirt road to look for a dispersed camping site. And she starts going, oh, this looks devious, I don't know, I don't like, maybe we should turn around, go back to the main road, see if we can find another dirt road. And I just, just from experience and just looking out at the land and all that stuff, I, I can just tell you, know, I think that there's going to be, I think we're going to be able to find a site here really soon. And then, boom, we usually do. One key thing about the forests, when you're on national forest land, is many of the dirt roads that you're on, were constructed to facilitate logging. You may see signs of logging, but oftentimes you're in second growth forests where it was logged 50, 60 years ago, and you may see some stumps, but there's a very mature second growth forest there, and those can be very attractive in their own right. Oftentimes, for the logging trucks to do what they need to do or to pass each other or to load logging trucks, there will be wide areas by the road. Oftentimes, they're 50 to 100 feet across where the, the great spots are dis dispersed camping there. There's lots of room to park. They're wide open to the skies so you can see the stars really well. So, yes, uh, uh, I've gotten really good at finding dispersed camp campsites, and there's, there's a science to it, and I discuss that in detail in the book. And there's also like an art that comes from just having the experience and just feeling like, yes, I think that's going to be there. And again, I don't mean to be overly metaphysical about that, but because part of it is you also need to be smart about saying, hey, we're driving, let's say, for, for many, many years, I had a Subaru Outback for nearly 20 years, and it has seven and a half inches of clearance. So there's times if you get on a dirt road and it starts looking pretty dubious and you start thinking, whoa, this may get so bad that I, it's going to be too rutted and, and too gnarly for my vehicle, you need to say, no, this isn't the vehicle for me. That's why one of my key pieces of advice in the book is when in doubt, scout, which means if you get somewhere and you think, hey, this road's looking, starting to look, I can still drive it, but it's starting to look like it wasn't as good a shape as I thought it was going to be in, and it's getting close to not being suitable for my vehicle. Stop your car, get out, walk 100 yards, 200 yards, 300 yards, and assess, one, the state of the road. Can you keep driving? And then, two, is there a dispersed camping site? You might walk 100 yards up there and go, hey, there's a great site right here, and my vehicle can make it. So, boom, you drive up there. You want to be careful about not getting in down a really nasty road and then finally coming up to something and saying, nope, I my vehicle can't do that. And then you have to figure out how you're going to turn around and get back down that road. So that's, that's an important consideration. That's part of being smart about what you're doing so you don't get into a uh, you know, bad situation. So that, that brings up a great point and, and somebody has a great question in the, in the chat. I, I'll get to that in a second. Just a quick reminder, if you have any questions for John about dispersed camping, boondocking, camping on public lands, uh, please add them as a comment in the chat and uh, we'll try to make sure you get the answers to that. If we don't answer it live, we'll monitor it over the next couple days so we can you know, make sure that we can find an answer for you as best as we're able to. Speaking of which, um, uh, Dina Redhead, asks, does your book give you a general idea whether a low clearance vehicle is able to make it to particular sites? And I think it's important to kind of make a distinguishing. It's what your, your book is not an atlas of all the places where you can go disperse camping. It's more of a handbook of a, a how-to book, you know, and how you can do the research and how you can ferret this information out and, uh, and, and do that. Would, would you, would you agree or what would you say to this? Oh, totally. My book is a how-to book. There are 
as I say in the book, and, and also on the Amazon page for the book, there are, this is just an estimate on, on my account, there's there's probably 500,000 places where you could do to disperse camping in the United States. There may be a million, there may be two million. So there's no way that I can catalog, yes, you can go here and you can do this, you can camp this spot, this spot, that I would spend the rest of my life doing that and would not finish it. Although I would probably have a lot of fun in the process. So uh, a low clearance vehicle can go a lot of places. If you have a sedan, and you have a tent, you can still do a lot of dispersed camping. You just have to be smart about it, and you have to realize the limitations of your vehicle. You need to, it's a good idea to talk to the people at the Forest Service that can give you advice. It's also good to learn how to read Forest Service maps that give you an indication. It's not always accurate but they give you an indication of what roads are suitable for passenger vehicles. You'll find that many of the U.S. Forest Service maps, they have uh, all their dirt roads on there, and they will classify them for what type of vehicle they're suitable for. Many of them, when you get to the start of a road, it may even have a sign where it will actually show a passenger vehicle, like this is suitable for a passenger vehicle, or it may have a passenger vehicle with a big red slash through it, and then you know not to do that. But that's just something that essentially, for me, the overall, the best vehicle for dispersed camping, as far as having the widest range of places that you can get to, would be a full-size van that is high clearance and all-wheel drive. And I've seen some of them, and they're really cool looking but they're the ones that can go on just about any road. They can go around any corner. And so that's that, That's where you have the, the most options there. But it's just really important to know the limitations of your vehicle and accommodate yourself to that. Uh, my, but, but, so, my, my buddy, uh, Ben, uh, who did a lot of dispersed camping with an RV with a fifth wheel, and he said he would have his mountain bike, you know, attached to the trailer or whatever and do the same kind of scouting you're talking about so they he would they'd park get on the mountain bike and ride that ride the road a little ways to see what was ahead and whether they could make it you know that is incredibly smart i say when in doubt scout and i talk about like getting out and walking but i love that idea of just hopping on your mountain bike and going and checking it out i mean that's the way you can find out really fast what it's like yeah yeah he's a smart guy Let's see. Uh, somebody asked for a link to buy the book. And uh, I see Ted Foster. Thank you, Ted, has uh, shared the link on Amazon. So it's available as both a Kindle book, uh, an ebook, as well as a, a paperback, right? Right, exactly. Here's the, here's the paperback right here. And so, yes, you can get the paperback. You can also get the Kindle version. Both of them are, are right there on that link on Amazon. I may eventually start making it available in bookstores, but for right now, especially with the, the pandemic and stuff, I've really just focused on the Amazon aspect of it. And I've got the book on my iPad. I've got the, the Amazon Kindle version. All right. So you get, you got, you get it all color. Yeah, so that's right. That's yeah. A, if you want to see, if you want to see the pictures in color and there's uh, probably 25 pictures or so in the book, Yes, right there. That's Bryce Canyon National Park. When uh, we uh, had to deal with, we got caught in snow, actually. That's one of the stories in the book, but we had to deal with snow last May. We were, yeah, we got caught in, well, I don't want to say we got caught in snow. We had to deal with snow and we dealt with it effectively. But after that night of dealing effectively with the snow and not getting stuck in the snow, we went to Bryce and the snow was melting out and that's why there was only just that little snowman left. So anyway, the book is, uh, has black and white photos, but they look, they, Amazon prints really, really well. I was very impressed with their production process of just making it all look really, really good. I was very, very happy with that. Uh, so, but if you want color, yeah, you want to go with the Kindle version. Hey, uh, Lauren Cheeseman was asking about resources for finding sites for 
disperse camping. So, uh, and he says that his ex in his experience, people are a little secretive about the the good spots, probably for good reason. You know, we don't want it to be overrun. But um, what resources? What's your process? Maybe to walk us through that. And what resources do you use to help you uh, find the good spots? Well, there are a lot of resources out there. I created a set of web pages, and one of those pages has an extensive list of resources that will help you to find sites. Some are more general, and some are very specific. So if you go to dispersedcamping.net, that's dispersedcamping.net, it will actually forward you to a page on my main northerncaliforniahikingtrails.com page. And there at the dispersed camping page on my main hiking trails website, you'll see that I have links to a lot of different resources, uh, including an extensive list of what to take when you go um, when you go dispersed camping. It runs about uh, there's a couple hundred items there. So yeah, freecampsites.net is one of the somebody just popped that up there in a comment. Freecampsites.net is definitely one of the sites that is good for finding free campsites. So back to my website. My website, I talk about websites you can go to. I talk about apps that you can use to help you find dispersed camping sites. A couple of things to note about this. I said that there were several hundred thousand, maybe a million or more dispersed camping sites throughout the United States. These websites and these apps have just a tiny percentage of them. And in many ways, I think that's, I don't want to say that's a good thing because I know people want the app. They want to know, oh, geez, we're driving through here. Where can I find a place to do dispersed camping? Oh, look at this app. It says I can go here. Well, when I was researching these apps, I looked around primarily around the Mount Shasta area, which is an area I know very, very well, having lived there and written a book on the area and explored there for years and years and years. Um, it's, it's, I would look and see, oh, okay, freecampsites.net, they would have a handful of sites there, but I would think, well, I know that there's far more than that there. So they are in no way complete and there's no way they truly can be complete. So you, you need to realize that. And then there is the secrecy aspect to it. There are a lot of people and in some ways I am perhaps one of them in that when I have certain sites in certain areas for example, if I were to put them up onto one of these websites, does that mean that two or three people a day would be going to that one site trying to use it? And would it get overrun? And would it become too popular? So there's there, there's questions about that. And some people, there are some sites that I'm really happy to share. And then there's a few others that uh, I, I, th I think it's best to keep them private. So that's what happens. Some people will share and some people uh, are, are hesitant. To, to share their sites. So, uh, John, what are some of the tips that you have for, you know, like safety considerations when you're dispersed camping? Because you don't have the comfort of, you know, having, you know, campground Wi-Fi or a camp host or a ranger or whatever right by you. What are the what are the safety considerations beyond that even? Well, there's a lot of safety considerations. Key considerations are that you really need to be self-sufficient. You can't count on cell reception, for starters. Some places will have great cell reception. A lot of the times, though, there is no cell reception. So you can't assume, oh, I'm kind of doing this dangerous thing, or I'm not really well prepared. Well, if I really have to, I will call a friend to come bring me something, or to come get me out of this mess, or... Um, just something like that. You really have to be prepared. You have to make sure your vehicle is in really good shape for starters. So make sure your fluid levels are topped off. Check your tires. If you're concerned about any mechanical issues, have a mechanic check your, check your vehicle in detail before you go out there. Make sure you have basic supplies for doing basic repairs on your vehicle. Do you know how to fix a flat on your vehicle, for example? So there's just things like that. 
make sure you have plenty of water and plenty of food. I always you know, tell Stephanie, like, oh, how much water should we bring? And I always say, let's bring a couple extra gallons. I'd rather have too much water and not need it than not enough water and sure wish I had it. So you need to do, you know, you really have to be prepared for that. So it's a little bit like being in a, you know, a covered wagon coming across the United States in the 1850s and you're coming to the Oregon Territory or something. But you, just, you, really, you don't want to get you dysentery really want to get though, right? <laughs> you, don't, you don't want to get dysentery, which of course means you bring your own water or make sure you have really good systems for treating your water. Uh, you also want to pay attention to things about if you're in bear country, you really want to keep food scraps, food scents away from your vehicle and if you're camping out in your tent, especially away from your tent and things like that. So you really want to follow those, those key things. You may want to hang your food way far away if you need to do that or keep it in your vehicle very tight tightly wrapped up inside a box, inside a box, all boom, 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 so odors won't be getting out, things like that. <clears throat> if you take dogs, which a lot of people do, I talked about how I started dispersed camping, but one of my most expensive, extensive period of dispersed camping occurred over a two-year span in a Ford Econoline van that was equipped with some storage cabinets and then a sleeping platform and some slider windows with screens. I did that with my two golden retrievers, Hana and Molly. There's a, a picture of them in the book. And they were great companions, but, <clears throat> no, not but. And you have to be careful about their safety when you're out doing dispersed camping. For example, <clears throat> When you're way out in the boonies, you need to be careful your dogs just don't get lost. You either have to be sure your dogs are trained to stay very near you, or you're going to have to put them on some sort of leash or a tie line. Losing a dog way, way, way in the back of beyond, that just may be it for your dog. So you have to pay attention to that. You also have to be aware that your dog can draw critters like a mountain lion, for example, to your campsite. So there's just some awareness issues around that. That said, I've never had my dogs, I never really had any problems with them when I was out dispersed camping. Hey, so, uh, so think about that. Lauren's, Lauren's got a great question since we were talking about bears and wildlife. Uh, do you recommend using a bear can? I, when I've gone backpacking in bear country, a lot of times bear canisters are required. Mm -hmm. um, so have you ever used something like that or had it, you know, has that been a consideration? I personally have not, but I have a, a system for storing my food very, very well inside of my vehicle so that I feel pretty comfortable with that. And plus I sleep inside the vehicle so I don't feel as vulnerable being, um, you know, like, oh, I'm outside camping in a tent, but I do think that in many instances that would be a good idea. If you have a bear canister, by all means, use it. So uh, yeah, I think that's a good idea. Yeah, I've got a couple of bear canisters, you know, different sizes depending on the type, the, the length of the backpacking trip that I'm planning. But I've never thought to take them car camping or dispersed camping or anything like that. But if I were doing that in bear country, it might, it would definitely give me a little more peace of mind. It's not. You know, um, and par partly because for me, I I like to bring a tent. I, I, my vehicle is not conducive to sleeping in, and I've got two big, pretty good sized dogs and my wife, and it would just be too much, to, you know, humanity and, and, and too many warm bodies in one enclosed space. So um, my preference is to do with a, go with a tent. And that just kind of, you know, yes, you could still use the car as a place to keep it uh, food safe from small critters, but big critters, you know, the, the apex predators, then, you know, maybe not so much. Right. And in that case, yeah, I would be very smart about your food. And I think bear canisters would be a good way to go. I have a friend named Tristan Higby who has written a book called SUV RVing. He has an SUV and he has set it up to sleep in. So he sleeps in there and he's just 
he's a very tight space, but he's definitely able to do that. And he did a YouTube video about a woman who also has a Kia Sedona, but she travels with actually so much stuff in her Kia Sedona that she literally has to pitch a tent. She pitches a tent beside her van, and then she takes all this stuff out of her van so she has room to sleep in her van. But my point for you might be that, yeah, you have your dogs. Um, you have uh, two dogs and a wife. But you may be able to do something where if you would be more comfortable sleeping in the vehicle, where you actually could have a tent and then you take a lot of the stuff out of your vehicle and put it in there so you have room to sleep. And then maybe the dogs could, one dog sleeps on the passenger seat and one dog sleeps in the driver's seat. That's one way to do it. I can say that after I got rid of my Ford Econoline van and bought my Subaru Outback, I did a lot of dispersed camping with two golden retrievers. And we, all three of us slept in the back of my Subaru Outback. Oh, yeah. And I was able to make that. I, I would sleep on a diagonal because I had to do that because I'm a little over six, one, six feet tall. And so the Outback just wasn't big enough. It's flat and level, and that's great. And the seats go down. But I had to be on a diagonal. I put one dog kind of closer up to my head on that one sort of triangle there and the other dog farther down by my feet. I put the dog that didn't move as much uh, <laughs> up closer to uh, uh, up closer to my face and the one that didn't like twitch in the middle of the night with her paw so she wouldn't like smack me in the face with the paw. But I made it work and it, and it worked out pretty well. That's awesome. Yeah. Hey, um, any questions for John while well, we have him on here? We've got... Uh... Uh, we've had a, few, a lot of good advice come in. Uh, people who say they've bought your book, that's awesome. Uh, Dina, they're in the process of converting a Ford full-size 4x4 van, specifically for dispersed camping. <laughs> looks like they've oh, got a perfect. good choice, yeah? Yeah, yeah, that's an excellent choice, and I'm sure they're doing this already, but if you go on YouTube and just type in your type of van and, like, conversion for camping, you will just come up with just a huge wealth of, of resources of people just uh, giving you lots and lots of great advice about what to do. And um, uh, while we're at it, uh, I know that um, Emma is going to post something as SoCal Hiker in the comments. And if you would like to be included in the drawing for a copy of Free Camping by John, then you'll ju you just follow the instructions on her comment. I think it's you reply to her comment and she's going to use random.org to randomly select one of you as the lucky winner. So um, we'll watch for that in the comments. Uh, Ted asks a great question. So what was the experience you learned the most from? I'm sure you've got lots of stories and you have a number of them in the book, but what did you learn the most from? Well, the story that's popping into my mind, I like to explore. So when I camp in an area, I'm always hoping that I can also explore in that area. And I obviously, I love the hike. I'm a hiking guidebook author. So I also love the Southwest. Way back, uh, probably 20 years ago, when I was in the Ford Econoline van with Hana and Molly, my two golden retrievers, we were doing dispersed camping in Escalante Grand Staircase National Monument. We were right on the edge of that, for those of you that know that area, we were right on the edge where it drops down to the drainage of the Escalante River. So we were in this primo site. It was at eating dinner and it was right around sunset. And I thought, oh, I just want to go for a walk for just a half a mile or so. So let's just go a ways down into the drainage and we'll watch the sunset and it'll be beautiful. And then we'll go back. So what happened, and this is a, a key thing that you really have to pay attention to, is don't get lost, essentially, is the, the key message of the story. So what happened is I thought, okay, I was paying attention. I know the van is right up there. I know where we are. I know how to get back there. So I go walking back there in the gathering dusk, and I get up to where I think the van is, and I don't see it. So there's all these pinyon pines around. So it's not like it's open, flat desert, so I can just literally see for miles. I can't. There's all these 
pinyon pine trees I really can't see. So I what I do is I back out a little bit so that I can start again so I get a little different angle. Maybe it was there and it's like, no. And then I start doing widening circles around where I thought it was. I didn't find it. And it's just getting darker and darker and darker. So finally what I did is I'd gotten to this campsite by taking a main dirt road that is off Highway 12 and then I turned left on a small side road to get down to my campsite. And I thought, I don't want to spend the whole night out here. So what I did is I walked just you know, cross country through the desert about probably half a mile or so or several hundred yards towards A12, the main paved road. Then I cut over, my plan was to cut over and find the main dirt road that I came in on. Then I would know which way to turn on that road because I knew you know, where I was in relation to um, uh, the dirt, my, my final dirt road, and then I was hoping that in the dark I could walk down that road and then see the little dirt road that I was camped on and then be able to follow that. So what happened is that all worked. I wound up running with the dogs beside me um, while I still had a little bit of light and got to that main dirt road in the dark, turned left like I needed to do, and you can actually see by starlight. When you have a really clear sky and you have starlight, you can see a bit. And I was able to see, and I was barely able to make out my little dirt road that went off to my, I was hoping it was my little dirt road. And so I walked down there, and after a few minutes, ah, there was the van. So that's, uh, that's something that was a really key experience about just being really clear about where you are and not getting lost. I was a little overconfident on that one. Don't get lost. All right. Yeah. Hey, uh, Allison writes or asks, uh, how many days do you go out for without returning to civilization? What's the longest stretch? The longest I've done is a week, but... It's really just a matter of what do you take for resources and what do you need to be comfortable if, uh, like your your friend that's got, that's got that, I think it was a Ford van that they're converting, they're probably going to you know, have plenty of room to be comfortable. The key thing is, do you have enough food? Do you have enough water? Do you have enough things to keep you entertained and happy? And do you have a way to like keep yourself clean or clean enough? So you can take a solar shower. Your vehicle may even be equipped with a shower. I've actually showered before with biodegradable soap, by the way, and far, far away from water sources. I've used gallon jugs of water, the ones that are like milk jugs. And I just use those and pour it over my head and shampoo and do my thing and grab another one and rinse off. And that's, you know, that's worked for me doing that. So a week, but... Uh, I bet there's people that have gone far longer than that. Hey, so um, before I forget, uh, Emma has posted a comment as SoCal Hiker in the chat. It says, hello, reply to this comment to enter to win. So uh, if you're interested in winning a copy of the book, just hit reply to that comment, and then she'll have your name and, and details, and we'll be able to draw a winner. So um, go ahead and do that. I have your website up. Let me see if I can share this. There we go. So uh, we have your um, uh, Northern California Hiking Trails website and a little bit about your book about, you know, Camp for Free and that it's now available and all of that. So um, if people are interested in the book, uh, want to learn more about dispersed camping, or your website has some of this information, right? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, and as I was saying earlier, it's got quite a bit of information about the book itself. And then I put all the resources for dispersed camping on there. Since this is a print book and website URLs can change, websites become defunct, new websites come up that are great, new apps are developed that are, are good. I... And in the book, I mentioned this time and time again, go to dispersedcamping.net, which forwards you through to, to uh, these pages here. Uh, go there for the latest on the websites and the apps and, and things of that nature. So that's a very, very important resource. Yeah, this is excellent. So you've got all of the links to the websites, to the various apps that are available, 
Um, and then also just the public information, like the BLM maps and mm -hmm. um, U.S. Forest Service maps and all of that information. So really nice to have it all in, in one place. And they can see all about your other guidebooks and that's right trail guides and whatnot. So if the if you like camp for free, you might also <laughs> and you like hiking, you might you might want to check those out as well. Yes, absolutely. Let's see. Oh, so uh, one more question here from Mary. She this is she was asking. Um, let's see if I can put that up there. Uh, why a Kia Sedona versus other vehicle options? They eventually want to buy a vehicle good for dispersed camping, but also has good gas mileage. For us, everybody, any vehicle you get is a compromise. So you, the larger the vehicle typically the worse the gas mileage and then there may be some roads that are too narrow for you to drive down because brush will scrape against the sides or things like that then when you get smaller vehicles they get better gas mileage but they don't have much room for sleeping in you can't take as much stuff and you can't have your little kitchen in there and you know all this sort of stuff so every vehicle is a compromise stephanie and i decided that we wanted to get a minivan uh, at least for now, we wanted to do a minivan for a few years and then just see how much dispersed camping that we wanted to do together. And is it something we might ever want to do for months at a time? And perhaps two, three, four, five, six years down the road, we decide we want to get a larger vehicle that has more amenities and is more comfortable and all those sorts of things, probably a full size, a full size van of some sort. So for us, we went with the Kia Sedona. We actually wanted to get a Toyota Sienna, which is like the uh, like the gold star, most popular of the minivans, and we kept looking. There weren't that many around that were in. Certainly, and we didn't want one with too many miles because one thing about dispersed camping is you want a vehicle that's in pretty good shape. So if you have a vehicle that has a substantial number of miles on it, it's just more likely to have problems. So we were looking for something that had the right combination of relatively low miles and uh, not all that expensive because we saw this as potentially kind of not a real long-term thing, maybe just a few years. So we didn't want to sink a lot of money into it. We also wanted something, a vehicle that could be my just daily driving vehicle. So something that's like easy to park and of course a minivan is just easy for just day-to-day -day driving and of course gets good gas mileage. So the Kia Sedona for us, it just turned out that there was a woman in Grants Pass who put it up on Craigslist and it had uh, really low miles and it was just an absolutely fantastic condition and it had a really good price. So for us, it was the dark horse candidate, but after we drove it, it just rides so smoothly. It just had everything we needed. So that's why we went with the Kia Sedona. And that's why we went with a minivan in general. Very so, cool. Very cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. So my, one of the things that I'm kind of interested in is, you know, there's, there seems to be a little bit of overlap between sort of um, this dispersed camping and overlanding. And, um, I'm kind of intrigued by that. So last year I bought a 17 year old Land Rover Discovery, a Discovery 2, and uh, I've been, you know, getting it kind of ready for something like that. And, mm -hmm. um, but I think we're still going to go with sleeping in a tent, honestly. Yeah. So, um, yeah. you know, I, I considered a rooftop tent or something, which would be also be pretty quick to set up. And, um, mm -hmm. but, uh, the two dogs kind of factor into that, and that that would that wouldn't fly, I don't think. So uh, yeah, that would be a hassle. Yeah. But then again, you might be able if they were comfortable, like just sleeping in the car without you there. And my golden retrievers just got really good at. Uh, I lived on the coast, uh, Northern California coast near Crescent City and Del Norte County, north of Arcata, for for several years, which is never hot there. And oftentimes I would go in the Subaru Outback. I just always took them with me. And whatever I was doing, they were just in the back seat. I had a blanket down. They were just fine and happy. They just go to sleep and wait for me to come back. And they were just totally happy there. So it could be your dogs maybe 
they get to where it's kind of like a second little home den for them. And that's true. They are they are very happy. They're good. They're good travelers. So we did a twenty six hundred mile trip last May, uh, wow. all the way down into Arizona and up through Utah and all that, and they were great. So, or excuse me, we only had one at that time. So the one was great. But <laughs> and uh, we do have a winner announced for the book. And all right. If you're, if you're looking in the chat, you'll see Allison Moir. You are the winner tonight. And so look for a, a direct message from us and we'll contact you for details and get a copy of the book out to you. Congratulations, Allison. Yay! Yeah, congratulations. Yay! So, uh, John, I really, you know, this hour has kind of flown by. I, I wanted to just say thank you and uh, raise, a, raise a toast. I actually have a, a, a can of Golden Road, Golden Road Wolf Pup Session IPA. Let's see if that focuses there. There we go. And um, I want to give a toast to uh, many future safe and fun adventures in dispersed camping. Thanks to you, John. Absolutely. Yes. Well, thank you so much. And here's to everybody out there. Enjoy dispersed camping and definitely do it safely. All right. I I put up a slide here or a picture of uh, your outback somewhere in I forget where that is, but um, with the links to your websites, we also have those links in the chat itself, so uh, you can find all of that there. Uh, and then, as I said, if we didn't get to your questions, both John and I will take a look at the questions that have come in, and uh, you can still ask questions even after this is over. Um, for anybody who missed this or you missed a part of it or you have a friend you'd love to share this with, Facebook will actually um, save this as a saved video and it takes, I don't know, 10 minutes or something later, it'll go live uh, or not live, it'll be go recorded so that you can rewatch this and uh, continue that conversation and share it with your friends. So thanks a lot, John, for joining us tonight and thank you all for who participated in the live uh, the live video feed, the live video stream. That was a lot of fun for me and hopefully a lot of fun for you, John. And uh, we'll, next, we'll do something new next week. So join us for our, our virtual happy hour every week, Thursdays at 7 p.m. Signing out, this is Jeff from SoCalHiker.net. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Jeff. So long. Bye-bye.